The year is 1937. It's only a matter of time until World War II breaks out. In anticipation of the coming storm, the Imperial Japanese Army establishes a secret spy organization known as D-Agency. A series of rigorous tests and training are subsequently held to find the future spies who will work under it, and ultimately, eight young men get selected. Their names are Miyoshi, Kaminaga, Odagiri, Amari, Hatano, Jitsui, Fukumoto, and Tazaki. Interestingly, despite the harsh environment that they've been put through during their training, None of them are graduates of the War College, yet they managed to show that their mental and physical abilities were on par with or better than those of the soldiers. Lieutenant Colonel Yuki, the man who proposed the establishment of D-Agency as well as its spymaster, has appointed Sakuma to be the liaison between the agency and the IJA. Sakuma accepted the job with pleasure. However, there's something that's still troubling his mind. Each of these eight men has lived with aliases, fake background stories, and identities since the beginning of their training period. They can't even disclose their personal information to their colleagues. The fact that they can live like that is still hard for Sukuma to process. One night, when Sukuma is going out of his bed to fill up his water pitcher, he finds the eight men hanging out in the cafeteria. Some of them are playing a card game, while the rest are doing other things. When the spies see Sukuma, they invite him to join their game. Sukuma agrees, thinking that it's poker, However, after a few rounds, Sukuma just can't seem to win. In the end, he accepts his defeat and excuses himself. As he's about to leave, the spies reveal to him that what they were playing wasn't poker. Instead, it was a game they created which they call the Joker game. The true goal of the game is not necessarily to win, but it's to know what the opponents have in their hands based on the signs given by their accomplices, the people who are not playing. However, there's no way to tell who is on whose side. The signs given can also be fake in order to outwit opponents. On top of that, there's a possibility that an accomplice betrays his companion and joins his opponent. According to them, this game can be compared to the way international politics work. However, not understanding what it's like to be a spy, Sukuma thinks that the game is unfair nevertheless. He even calls it cowardly. As he complains about it, suddenly Yuki enters the room. Upon learning what the fuss is about, he coldly disagrees with Sukuma. Since they're now in a spy training facility, the selected spies need to practice the art of gathering information, as the only thing waiting for them after their being dispatched is solitude. Yuki proceeds to ask Sukuma what he would do if the enemy captured him to extort confidential information, to which Sukuma confidently answers that he'll kill the enemy or himself. The spies in the room laugh when they hear this response. According to Yuki, murder or suicide is an idiotic approach to this problem as it will only lead to bigger problems. Nobody who's truly a spy would think like that. When a spy commits murder or suicide, they'll only bring more attention to themselves, leading their secret to be exposed sooner or later. He then challenges Sukuma with another question. What would happen after you commit suicide? Without the slightest hesitation, Sukuma says that he'll proudly reunite with his compatriots in the afterlife and he's very certain about that. Yuki turns to Miyoshi and Kaminaga to ask their thoughts about it. The two of them are unanimous in their beliefs that such kind of faith is a tautology, meaning that it's a dynamic idea only followed by people confined in their own bubbles. Yuki then adds that if spies want to survive, they have to rely on their adaptability, as they don't have a real concept of such things as death or faith. That's when Sukuma realizes that these people are a bunch of monsters. Instead of being driven by a sense of honor or patriotism for Japan, they take action out of their pride, telling them that they can do it. The next day, Sukuma gets called to Colonel Muto's office. He's ordered to bring evidence that John Gordon, an American who came to Japan to run a business, is a spy. Gordon himself is suspected of having taken pictures of the IJA's cryptographic chipers. Sukuma then relays this order to Yuki. Surprisingly, Yuki doesn't find any point in that. He believes that a suspected spy is like a crippled soldier, meaning Gordon is already finished from the start. But since orders are orders, he ends up agreeing to cooperate with the plan as follows. First, the spies will masquerade themselves as military police. Then Miyoshi will take over. Once they get proof, they'll leave as soon as possible before the real MP comes. But Miyoshi has an idea. He wants Sukuma to join in and act as an MP lieutenant while he himself plays the role of the lieutenant's interpreter. Sukuma has no problem with it. It's decided then that they'll move out at 8am. When they arrive at the scene, Gordon is full of wrath. He's adamant there's nothing in his house that can prove that he's done anything bad. Miyoshi steps forward to whisper that the lieutenant, meaning Sakuma, will perform harakiri if they don't find anything. Hearing this, Gordon laughs. He starts to speak in Japanese, saying that he's looking forward to it. Finally, John opens up the way to his house. The confused Sukuma demands Miyoshi's explanation. 
Miyoshi himself doesn't conceal the truth that he just sacrificed Sukuma. Once all the personnel have entered the house, Sukuma takes a good look at John's face. He's baffled by Gordon's confidence. As the spies clutter every inch of Gordon's house to find evidence, Gordon keeps screaming at Sakuma. He ends up revealing that it's the second time the MP has ransacked his house. This information shocks Sakuma. He realizes that if it's actually true, then the spies won't find anything either. Colonel Muto intentionally assigned them this mission just to entrap D agency. Then one by one, the training spies come out to report that they've found nothing. This can only mean that Sakuma is ultimately bound to perform Harakiri. As a member of the IJA, Sakuma has no choice but to be true to his words. He sits on the ground ready to face death while John spectates eagerly. As he unsheaths his sword, everything he experienced the previous night comes back to him. From Yuki's words regarding committing suicide and murder and the Joker game they played, to his faith being called a tautology. And as he recalls these moments, he keeps thinking about the possibilities of where the evidence could be. Eventually, he puts his sword back into its sheath. To his subordinates, he then shouts, Back of the Imperial portrait! John's eyes widen with shock. On the other hand, Miyoshi gives Sukuma a witty smirk. Sukuma has realized that if there's anything in John's house that the real MP wouldn't dare to touch, it's the Imperial photo. But since these spies aren't part of the military, it wouldn't be a big deal for them to touch or investigate it. Later, Sukuma is back in D-Agency's building to report to Yuki. Before concluding his report, he inquires Yuki whether he knew that the actual military police had been in Gordon's house to search for the evidence prior to D-Agency's arrival. Yuki smiles upon hearing that question. A few moments later, Sukuma leaves Yuki's office. It turns out that Miyoshi has been waiting for him outside. He invites Sukuma to join the other spies in eating at a fancy restaurant, but Sakuma politely refuses. Sakuma then walks away as his mind wanders around the possibility that Colonel Muto was afraid of losing his reputation after the MP he commanded to search John's house failed to attain anything. So he sent D agency to cover up his failure, hoping they'd make the same mistake. This way, his mistake wouldn't seem like a big deal. However, Sakuma still can't understand how Yuki learned about the search conducted by the real MP. If anything, Colonel Muto would try to hide his failure at all costs. In the middle of his walk, Sakuma suddenly stops. He remembers that Colonel Muto looked hungover when he gave him the order. This is when he gets a moment of enlightenment and understands what happened. The next day, Sakuma reports to Muto that the agency found proof in Gordon's house. As expected, Muto is utterly shocked by this information. He's even more flabbergasted upon finding out that D-Agency didn't bring back the microfilm that contains the ciphers. He berates Sakuma, calling him an imbecile for not claiming back such an important piece of evidence. However, in Sakuma's defense, there's no need to do it since the army can just change the encryption without harming anyone. As for Gordon, Yuki plans to make him a double agent. The more Muto hears Sakuma's report, the more furious Muto becomes. His anger confirms that he's immensely envious of Yuki for taking the credit. At the peak of his wrath, Sakuma hands him the cigarette case that he dropped at Hanabishi, a Japanese traditional restaurant he often visits. Lastly, before Sakuma leaves the office, he whispers to Muto that it's forbidden for military personnel to disclose the details of an MP raid to anyone, including a geisha whom he visits regularly. This causes Muto's wrath to escalate. In the end, he tells Sakuma off, demanding him to leave before he throws a tantrum alone in his room. It turns out that the previous night, Sakuma visited the restaurant to privately ask a geisha there a few questions regarding Muto. The geisha confirmed that Muto was indeed there, heavily drunk and in a terrible mood in the evening before he gave Sakuma the order to investigate Gordon. She also informed Sakuma that there was a man in the room next to Muto's who fell asleep after drinking too much. Sakuma then asked whether this man had distinctive traits such as walking with a cane or wearing a white glove on his right hand. Subtly referring to Yuki, the geisha shook her head. However, that man handed her the cigarette case Muto had dropped. The geisha then passed the case to Sakuma asking him to bring it to Muto. Now, on Sukuma's way back from Muto's office, he comes across Yuki. They walk in unison with Yuki in front of Sukuma. Still having a lot of things on his mind, Sukuma straight up asks Yuki if his cane is a disguise. Yuki doesn't even have to answer it because Sukuma already knows that Yuki can walk perfectly well without a cane, and the white glove he always wears on his right hand is also a cover to make his prosthetic left hand less noticeable. It turns out that Sukuma already had a forensic expert examine Muto's cigarette case. They didn't detect fingerprints other than those of Muto, the geisha who held onto it, and Sukuma himself. This means that the person who picked it up might have used a glove or a prosthetic. 
As the two of them keep walking, Yuki confirms that it was indeed him who overheard Muto drunkenly blabber about the raid. It was also him who picked up Muto's cigarette case using his prosthetic left hand. Yuki then smirks, knowing he's won against Muto. This will eventually lead to more funding for D-Agency. He proceeds to ask Sakuma if he's interested in becoming a spy, but Sakuma answers that he'll remain a soldier who's prepared to sacrifice himself at any time. He then stops and lets Yuki keep walking forward in front of him, admiring Yuki as a troop marches beside him. Three years later, Hatano, disguised as a Japanese foreign exchange student in France named Shimano Ryusuke, wakes up with temporary amnesia. Upon opening his eyes, the first things he sees are three people of his age tending to him, Alain, Marie, and Jean. Despite being fully awake, his subconsciousness keeps telling him not to give the enemy information, making him wonder what's going on. From the look of it, he genuinely doesn't remember anything. Alain then tries to help Hatano remember things. Apparently France is currently under the occupation of Germany. Despite that, there wasn't particularly any trouble until an old woman taunted a German squadron. After things escalated, Germany finally decided to execute the woman in front of the public. However, Hatano came just in time to rescue her. It naturally created a commotion, which caused Hatano to end up getting hit right in the head with a soldier's rifle. That's how he got the amnesia. The three people in the room then start pointing out strange things about Hatano, such as his ability to speak multiple languages perfectly, his purely cosmetic glasses, and the fact that he had cotton balls stuffed in his mouth. Most importantly, while he was unconscious, he mumbled the words, 90 to 8 to 2. They're starting to doubt if he's really an ordinary Japanese student. Sternly, they look at Hatano and urge him to reveal his true identity. But just as Hatano is about to answer, his subconsciousness speaks to him again, telling him to stop talking. This is also when someone loudly knocks on their door, breaking the silence. It turns out that the German soldiers have arrived. Jan suspects that they've been tailed for bringing Hatano there. Quietly, Hatano walks to the door. Now that he's the one being targeted, he plans to surrender himself to avoid giving the others more trouble. But as he's turning the doorknob, his subconscious mind speaks again. This time, it tells him to keep on living. Alain also tries to stop him. He reveals that they're with the French resistance, so if Hatano gets caught, they'll get in the most trouble. Hearing this, Hatano steps back as he loses his will to surrender. Marie then suggests they sneak out using the back door. However, Hatano thinks it's a bad idea, since the soldiers most likely have guarded the back door as well. Still, that doesn't mean they have no hope left. Hatano asks if they have any kind of weapon. Later on, they show him a handgun, but it seems to be broken. Something appears to be stuck in it, making the trigger jammed. Aside from that gun, they have nothing else except kitchen essentials, such as flour, salt and sugar, as well as an old foot bellows. Hearing that, Hatano quickly orders Marie to fetch the bellows and the flour. He also asks Alain to keep an eye on the situation outside and tells Jean to loosen the light bulbs while he tries to fix the handgun. A few moments later, they gather in the corner of the house after everything is prepared. Hatano also managed to fix the gun. Marie curiously asks him how he did it, and Hatano responds that he just reassembled the parts. He then asks Marie to carry it so she can protect herself. Later on, the soldiers can be seen successfully breaking into the house, but they immediately have trouble breathing and seeing anything due to the thick dust of flour polluting the air. As soon as one of them turns on the light, the house explodes. Not only it harms the soldiers inside, but it also distracts the soldiers waiting outside. Hatano and the three resistance members use this chance to run away using the back door. Without breaking a sweat, Hatano tackles the one remaining soldier guarding it. They then flee as fast as possible. At one point, they stop to catch their breath. This is when Alan starts questioning how Hatano created the bomb. To put it simply, Hatano utilized the bellows to spray the flower into the air. This would create a highly flammable environment. It's basically similar as coal dust explosions that happen often in coal mines. After hearing Hatano's explanation, Alan proposes that they accept Hatano as an ally because he's rescued them as well as that old woman. Jean strongly opposes this. But since Marie also agrees with Alan, he has no choice but to go along with it. Hatano himself has yet to give his opinion regarding this. Instead, he suggests they keep running away first before the soldiers catch up to them. Unexpectedly, just right after Hatano, Alan and Jean take a few steps forward, Marie shouts at them from behind, ordering them to stop. When the three men look back, she's already pointing the handgun at them. The other three eventually grasp that Marie has been a German spy sent to infiltrate the resistance all along. But in Marie's defense, she has to do this in order to save her family. It was going well for a month until Hatano came and ruined her plan, and now she has no choice but to hand them over to the Germans. 
Hatano then slowly walks back to approach her. In panic, Marie threatens to shoot him if he gets any closer, yet her hands can't stop shaking. The more she tries to intimidate him, the more Hatano challenges her. Ultimately, she fires the gun, but it turns out to have empty casings. Then with incredible speed, Hatano grabs the gun from Marie and tries to restrain her. However, he's still not fast enough to avoid getting knocked out by Jean. In the end, he goes unconscious again. When he wakes up, the only person beside him is Jean. It turns out that Jean chose the love of his life, Marie, over the resistance. Hatano reveals to Jean that he already knew Marie was a rat since she asked what was wrong with the handgun. It wasn't actually broken, instead it was tampered with so it was clear that she was making sure whether Hatano had realized it or not. As for Jean, Hatano really didn't expect that he'd do it, but thanks to him, he's now regained his memory. He then part ways with Alain in a cordial way. Sometime later, Hatano arrives at a church. He enters the confession box, where Yuki has been waiting to hear his report. It's revealed that the phrase 90 to 8 to 2, he mumbled during his sleep, is the ratio of civilians to German collaborators to the resistance. Rescuing the old lady was a part of Hatano's plan in order to infiltrate the resistance, but getting hit in the head wasn't. Luckily, Yuki once taught him the method of imprinting one's mission objective into their subconscious mind in case of memory loss or confusion. This allowed Hatano to survive that situation. Once Hatano finishes reporting, Yuki orders him to go home. Now let's move on to another story taking place in Shanghai, which is currently occupied by Japan. On an ordinary day, Captain Oikawa calls Sergeant Honma to his office to give him a top-secret mission, and that is to find an enemy spy within the Shanghai Military Police. The captain informs the sergeant that MP Corporal Miyata, who was assigned this job previously, was killed last night. He then hands over Corporal Miyata's reports. When Honma is just about to pick it up from the table, the ground starts shaking vehemently, making him fall over. Once it stops, the two soldiers run to the window to analyze the situation. They then find out that Oikawa's house has been bombed. Later on, they arrive at the scene. Several people were killed by the explosion, including Oikawa's maid, two beggars who often sat in front of his house, and a child who often played behind the house. Inspector James quickly concludes that the explosion was caused by the beggars' cook fire. However, Honma strongly feels like that's not the case. After the captain and the inspector leave him, he looks around and catches sight of Private Yoshino looking terrified as he gazes deeply at one of the dead bodies. But when asked if there's anything wrong, he just says that it's nothing and leaves. The curious Honma checks the corpse that Private Yoshino has been staring at and he finds a butterfly tattoo on the body. Suddenly, someone from the crowd calls and waves at him. He turns out to be Shizuka Hajime a journalist whom Honma once investigated for operating a left-wing magazine three years ago. He came to show the sergeant an article he wrote about a Japanese-owned business building that was hit by mortars yesterday. Interestingly, when Shiozuka was investigating the scene, he saw Kusanagi Yukihito, the actual ringleader of the said left-wing magazine. Rumor also has it that Kusanagi made contact with the late Corporal Miyata. Shiozuka proceeds to give Honma a picture of Kusanagi for reference. At night, Honma wanders around the city's entertainment district and thinks about how to find Kusanagi. Well, he doesn't have to because suddenly, Kusanagi accidentally bumps his shoulder while he's walking. Realizing that he just saw Kusanagi, Honma turns back and attempts to follow him. After sneaking for a while, he ends up arriving at a dance hall. Inside, he spots Kusanagi entering a seemingly private room. Honma tries to follow Kusanagi, but he's stopped by the bouncers. They only allow Honma in after he presents them with a gold coin. He then walks in and suddenly in front of him is a big fancy upper-class restaurant with a casino, a night and day difference from the noisy dance hall outside. He notices some boys dressed up in a feminine way to serve the customers. Then he looks around until he catches a sight that makes him stunned. Some time has passed after that. Honma is now back in Captain Oikawa's office to report his mission progress. He stands straight. Without showing any facial expression, he makes a shocking and bold remark. He states that the bombing incident at Oikawa's house was tailored by Oikawa himself to cover up his own crimes using the anti-Japanese group as a scapegoat. Honma had noticed that something was off since he fell after the ground shook. At that time, Oikawa ran to the window as soon as the explosion occurred, as if he was already anticipating it and knew that there wouldn't be a second one. Oikawa doesn't deny Honma's suspicion against him. Instead, he smiles and acts full of himself, challenging Honma to do something about it. According to him, he was involved in an illegal opium trafficking business. It went well at first, but someone started to smell something fishy when the amount of opium in his vault didn't match what was in the record book, and that person was none other than Corporal Miyata. Therefore, Oikawa ordered a server boy with a butterfly tattoo 
whom he met in that fancy restaurant inside the dance hall to assassinate the corporal. After that, he set up the explosion to kill the boy to cover up his trace. All of a sudden, a gun is pointed at Honma from behind him. Oikawa knows that Honma doesn't have real proof, so he's confident that he still has the upper hand. But eventually, after Honma says that the letter containing the truth will be sent to the Ministry of War if he dies, Oikawa submits. Still, this surprises Honma. He thought that Oikawa was going to commit suicide. Hearing that, Oikawa laughs like a psychopath. He proceeds to blabber about himself being invincible since he can kill anyone anytime he wants. Yet ironically, after all that pretentious talk, someone from behind Honma shoots him dead so suddenly. That person turns out to be Private Yoshino. When Honma asks him why he did that, Yoshino answers that it's to avenge his lover, the boy with the butterfly tattoo. Tears fall down from Yoshino's eyes before he finally ends his life as well. Later on, Shiozuka is revealed to be Fukumoto. He plans to stay in Shanghai for a while, in the city where solitude and betrayal intertwine. The next story comes from Kaminaga who's carrying out his mission in London, disguised as a photographer named Izawa Kazuo. Before he departed, Yuki presented him with a Robinson Crusoe book. The book tells the story of a man who sailed the sea, got cast away on an uninhabited island, and saved a young savage whom he named Friday. Kaminaga thought that there might be a reason why Yuki gave him that book. One night in 1939, an unfortunate event befalls him. The UK's Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS, traps him in his photo studio and arrests him for suspected espionage. When interrogated, at first, he attempts to convince them that he's just an ordinary photographer who knows nothing. But then the interrogator pulls out a bunch of photos of him hanging out with German spies and members of the British Union of Fascists. Despite that, Kaminiger isn't deterred. He endures the interrogation that lasts an entire night without revealing his true identity, insisting that he's just taking over his sick uncle's business in London. When the morning comes, they finally give him a break, letting him use the restroom. As Kaminaga walks to the restroom, he takes a peek at one of the rooms with an open door and sees the floor plan of the building. Later on, he goes back to be interrogated again. Both sides still have yet to give up. After a full day of not gaining anything from Kaminaga, he's moved to another room to be interrogated by Howard Marks, the spymaster for the SIS himself. Marks intentionally commends Yuki for having an excellent subordinate like Kaminaga, Hearing that, Kaminaga realizes that he's already done for. Marx then proceeds to inject Kaminaga with their newly developed truth serum, which he claims can make anyone reveal their true self more than any amount of torture. Once it's used, it sends Kaminaga into a half-sleep state. The serum truly works. Now, Kaminaga is able to answer every question they ask. Kaminaga then realizes that he's being used as a pawn, and the one who blew up his cover is none other than Yuki himself. Now that he's defeated and has nowhere to go, he asks the SIS to use him however they want. The satisfied Marx proceeds to show him the Japanese Army Intelligence Codebook. He orders Kaminaga to send a fake telegram to Japan using the code. Kaminaga has no other option but to obey. Once he finishes, Marx allows him to eat with the condition that he's kept handcuffed because they can't lose him until they can confirm that the telegram actually does damage to Japan. The guard then takes Kaminaga out of the room. In the middle of their way, Kaminaga feels the need to use the restroom, so the guard takes him there. Then suddenly, as he's washing his hands, he screams frantically in front of the mirror. The guard has to check what's going on, and this is when Kaminaga uses the opportunity to escape. With a single punch, he knocks the guard unconscious and proceeds to release his handcuffs. It turns out that he's memorized the building's floor plan, so he knows that there's supposed to be an emergency exit at the end of the third floor and plans to escape through it. He manages to sneakily leave the restroom, climb the stairs toward the third floor, tackle a guard, and run to a corner. But when he makes a turn, luck isn't in his favor. In front of him is nothing but a wall. The emergency exit was a trap from the beginning. Kaminaga feels like giving up, but then he suddenly notices a door with a tiny symbol of Venus. That's when he realizes something. Meanwhile, the soldiers have gathered up on the third floor to search for him. It's not before one of them arrives at the door with the symbol. Slowly, the soldier opens it. Kaminaga is there, right in front of him. Yet, interestingly, he announces to his colleagues that no one is there. Even more interestingly, he puts something on the hook beside the door before gathering back with the other soldiers. It turns out that this soldier is a sleeper agent who acts whenever the SIS captures a Japanese spy. He has a code name, which is Friday the same name as the person saved by Robinson Crusoe in the book. He's also represented by a symbol of Venus. The things he gave to Kaminaga were keys and an escape route. So using that, Kaminaga successfully flees from captivity. 
Friday himself has been waiting for him with a car. After each of them says their password, he drives Kaminaga away from there. Apparently, Yuki once taught the spies that a perfectly coded message like the telegram Kaminaga just sent means a cry for help, and that moment should be used as a chance to escape. It is then revealed that Kaminaga was indeed used as a pawn, but not for any trivial cause. A Japanese diplomat in London was caught not encoding his communications. Since there was an incident of data leak three months ago, the army demanded the diplomat to encode all messages related to military matters. However, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs ignored the IJA's demand. Therefore, Yuki made a scenario in which Kaminaga was captured due to the diplomat leaking his identity. That way, they could put the blame on foreign affairs for the incident, and foreign affairs would end up being forced to fulfill the military's request. Now moving on to the next story. This one takes place in China, still in the year 1939. A train called the Asia has just departed from sinking. Three little boys, seemingly brothers, are sitting in the dining car. Their mother can't be bothered as she's too busy chatting with her friend. The middle child suddenly feels bored, seeing his older brother reading a book titled The Treasure Island Expedition. He suggests they go on their own expedition. Unfortunately, their mother forbids them from walking around. All he can do is just sit and endure. In another car, Anton Morozov sits nervously a few seats back behind Tazaki. Morozov works for the Soviet Union consulate in Manchuria. Three days ago, he contacted Japanese intelligence via an encoded newspaper ad. He seemed to have highly classified info, but he asked for a substantial amount of money in return. Regardless of that, both parties have agreed to make the exchange in the washroom, and the info is supposed to be printed on the newspaper he's carrying. At one point, Morozov walks toward the restroom, bringing the newspaper with him. Tazaki notices this. He observes the situation for a while before he follows Morozov to the restroom. First, he opens the washroom. Nobody is there. He then goes to the men's toilet. Unfortunately, he finds Morozov already dead there. But something catches Tazaki's attention. From Morozov's pocket, he pulls out the hanged man tarot car. This means that Morozov has been assassinated by Smirsh, a secret organization that's willing to mercilessly kill any spy betraying the USSR. Tazaki proceeds to go to the dining car, bringing the card with him. Now he has about an hour to find the murderer before the train arrives in Mukden. As he thinks about the possibilities of what happened to Morozov back in the toilet, his hand unconsciously plays a card trick with the tarot card he picked up. Coincidentally, the three brothers who were bored earlier see it. They're curious and amazed at the same time. The middle child, who is also the chattiest one, doesn't want to lose. He starts bragging that his older brother knows a lot of things about Asia. Apparently, their father works for the railway, so he does know some facts about it. For example, it's the fastest train ever produced by the South Manchurian Railway. It has two predecessors, which are called Pigeon and Swallow, and as their names suggest, Pigeon is slower than Swallow. Tazaki shows great enthusiasm while he's listening to all that talk. But he secretly has a plan for these boys. He gives them a riddle. What is a way of sending a letter from Mukden to Dairon that's faster than taking the Asia? Then he assigns them a mission for their so-called expedition. First, they have to find a person reading a newspaper from the previous day or earlier in the cabin in front of the dining car. Once they've found the person, they need to memorize his outfit, put the hanged man tarot card secretly at his feet, and come back as fast as possible. Only after they finish their mission successfully and safely that Tazaki will reveal the answer to that question. The reason Tazaki is targeting the person reading a few days old newspaper is because he assumes that it would take time for Morozov to encode the information on the newspaper so he couldn't have pulled it off using today's newspaper. In just a few minutes, the brothers are back. They eagerly report their mission's success. The oldest one has also managed to memorize the details of the suspect's outfit which includes black pants and a white jacket. Tazaki then offers to buy them juice as a reward. However, before they manage to order something, the middle child accidentally knocks over the glass of juice in front of Tazaki. This causes their mother to notice them and she can't help but scold them, forcing them to go back to their seats. Before they go, Tazaki ensures he'll tell them the answer to his riddle. A few moments later, the train's conductor announces that the train will arrive in Mukden soon. After that, he goes to a private compartment and from the outside, he whispers to his comrade that an enemy has detected them. However, he quickly notices something wrong. His comrade isn't there, instead it's Tazaki pretending to be them. The two of them then fight each other, which results in Tazaki successfully putting the suspect to sleep. Apparently, he already knew that someone as cowardly as Morozov wouldn't let his guard down so easily, unless with someone who could sneak up without arousing suspicion such as a conductor. Once Tazaki is done dealing with the conductor, he calls Elena to come out. Elena was Morozov's lover. The two of them made a plan to escape to America via Japan. However, it turns out that she's been secretly siding with the Smirsh, 
All this time, she was actually the conductor's accomplice who helped him kill Morozov. Tazaki ensures Elena that he won't turn her over to Smirsh with the condition that she works for Japan. Elena seems to agree with that. In the end, before the train arrives in Mukden, Tazaki fulfills his promise of giving the riddle's answer to the brothers. According to him, the thing that's faster than Asia is the pigeon. The brothers protest about it. They insist that Asia is still the fastest as the pigeon can't even beat the swallow in terms of speed. However, that's not the kind of pigeon Tazaki's talking about. He means the actual pigeons, as in the birds. Apparently, with the help of the wind, a carrier pigeon can travel as fast as 100 km per hour, beating Asia's speed. That's how Tazaki relays a message to an agent in Dairen as quickly as possible without getting intercepted. Finally, Tazaki and the brothers part ways in Mukden. Now it's time to follow Amari's journey. He's currently on the ship that's taking him to Honolulu, playing the role of an engineer named Osamu Utsumi. Three hours before the ship docks, the passengers gather to enjoy the, the view of Hawaiian Islands from afar, but Amari himself stays behind as he's too preoccupied with his crossword puzzle. All of a sudden, a woman named Cynthia screams in a panic, and simultaneously, a dog runs loose across the deck. The curious Amari approaches the woman to ask what's going on. She says that a dog came from out of nowhere and startled her daughter Emma, who now looks frightened. Amari tries to distract the little girl by calling a pod of dolphins with a whistle. Soon after that, the girl smiles and laughs again. Cynthia thanks Amari for making her feel better. Amari then goes back to his seat. When he arrives, he sees a man staring intensely at his crossword. The man introduces himself as Jeffrey Morgans. He claims to be a crossword enthusiast. That's why he couldn't help himself when he saw Amari's crossword out in the open. Hearing that, Amari is elated. He invites Morgans to help him solve some questions that he's been stuck with. One of the clues is blank variations, six letters. The last letter is A. Morgans easily answers Enigma. It seems to refer to the musical riddle created by the English composer Elgar. The answer reminds Amari of the encryption machine that the Germans are using. The two men then end up discussing the Enigma machine despite having been modified by the Germans to make them capable of producing over 200 trillion combinations of encryptions, Morgans believes that people can still break the codes with a little hint, such as by comparing an Enigma-encrypted message with an already decrypted one. Strangely, Amari gets serious out of nowhere. With a sudden change of tone, he announces that the Japanese Navy is also developing its own decryption machine that's comparable to the Enigma. He proceeds to expose Morgan's true identity. It turns out that he's a British spy named Louis MacLeod, who also goes by the codename The Prof. Amari is also aware that MacLeod is pretending to be an American to slip into Japan. For a moment, MacLeod is stunned, not being able to utter a single word. Afterward, he accuses Amari of being Cerberus, which seems to be a codename for someone who's targeting him. He subsequently pulls out a knife from his shoe and attempts to attack Amari. Fortunately, Amari manages to tackle him without breaking a sweat or hurting him. McLeod is baffled by how Amari recognized him even after the amount of plastic surgery he had to cover up his identity. Amari just says that there are some features that are unique to each individual. Before McLeod can demand more explanation, people suddenly go frantic. The British combatant ship is firing cannons at them. McLeod laughs in victory. The Royal Navy arriving there means that he's safe. He smiles as he bids farewell to Amari. To celebrate his goodbye, he picks up the glass of cocktail from the table and drinks it, thinking that nothing could go wrong. However, his body suddenly starts reacting oddly. Within a few seconds, he falls unconscious with his mouth foaming. His last words are, So you are really Cerberus. The onboard doctor later pronounces him dead, with cyanide poisoning being the cause. It turns out that Amari had learned about McLeod and his plan back before he embarked on the ship. He was a key member of the British Enigma decryption team. Amari's mission was to make sure he didn't step foot in Japan, and it seems like his mission is accomplished, albeit in an unexpected way. A few moments later, the Royal Navy officers arrive at the passenger ship. They urge the captain to turn over Morgan's AKA McLeod, but the damage has been done. The captain is hesitant to say anything. Suddenly, a seaman runs toward the woman who screamed earlier to check her condition. He calls her Mrs. Grain. Upon hearing that name, Amari instantly checks the list of passengers. He sees her and her daughter's names along with listed together with their pet dog, Frate. This list makes him realize something. He then whistles loudly and calls Frate's name, making everyone's attention turn to him. As he had guessed, Frate is the same dog that was running loose earlier. Once he has Frate in his arms, he tells the Royal Navy that he can explain Morgan's death, but he needs a little time first. The Navy is fine with that. Later on, Amari confronts Cynthia Grain privately, asking if she's actually Cerberus. He also picks up something from Frate's collar. 
the picture of McLeod before he had facial reconstruction. In that picture, McLeod is standing with another man. Cynthia then begins her explanation. According to her, if there are things that someone can't change with plastic surgeries, it's the ears. By looking at people's ears, she was able to recognize McLeod among the passengers. However, right after he'd spotted McLeod, she saw Frate at his feet. She panicked because McLeod's photo was hidden inside Frate's collar. That's why she shouted at him back then. Now that McLeod is gone, Amari suggests she throw away the photo into the sea to get rid of the evidence. But she refuses because the man standing beside him in that photo is her late husband and Emma's father who fell victim to McLeod's crime. She just doesn't have the heart to get rid of that photo. Cynthia herself had already discovered McLeod's true nature when she overheard him talking about his evil plan at her husband's funeral. So in order to take revenge, Cynthia became a German spy. However, she just can't bring herself to abandon Emma. Whenever she sees her daughter's face, she keeps questioning the decisions she's made. Suddenly, Emma, who's been sleeping soundly, wakes up. Amari attempts to distract her by taking her and Frate to see dolphins again. Realizing that Amari is doing her a favor, Cynthia cries. She quietly bids farewell to Emma from behind, before surrendering herself to the Royal Navy. Now Amari is left with a little girl and a dog. Although he doesn't know what the future holds, he tries to keep a positive attitude, assuring himself that they'll work it out somehow. Meanwhile, back in Japan, Colonel Muto and an IJA officer named Akutsu are having a private talk. Apparently, Shirahata Kichiro, a diplomat who works closely with Britain, is suspected of having leaked a top-secret military strategy to the British Consul General, Ernest Graham. Their suspicion is supported by the fact that Graham is planning to return to Britain very soon. Since they can't let this grand strategy fall into the enemy's hands, they need to take immediate action. At the same time, Gamu is peacefully playing chess with Graham in the British Consul's estate, when Graham's wife suddenly interrupts them to express her worry about the man who's been peeking at them from the back gate since yesterday. In Gamu's opinion, that man looks like he's a military policeman. It can easily be deducted from the tan line on his forehead, which aligns with the MP hat he must often wear. Hearing that, Graham tells Jane not to worry. He suggests she go get some fresh air outside and take the parasol he bought for her while she's at it. Soon after that, Gamu excuses himself as well. Later, Gamu is seen entering a hidden bar, followed by Cho, Graham's servant. Gamu offers Cho several bundles of money in exchange for information regarding Graham. Therefore, Cho reveals that Graham received confidential orders from Britain, prompting him to return home soon. Cho knows nothing about the details, though. Afterward, Gamu reminds Cho of the money he owes, which equals five years of his salary. A debt collector then appears in front of Cho, making a threatening gesture. Cho panics. He begs Gamu to give him more time. In desperation, he also states that he's willing to do anything as long as he's spared. Hearing that, Gamu smiles at the realization that he's earned an accomplice. It turns out that Gamu has been tailing Graham for some time. So far, Graham has presented himself as a very cautious person, even Loki too cautious. However, there's still no proof of him having the grand strategy, so to confirm this, Gamu has made a plan. He gives Cho some sleeping drugs and orders him to give them to the guards on duty. Judging by the commands he gives, it seems like he's plotting what appears to be a robbery. Gamu promises Cho to split the money they'll gain, 50, 50. At night, Gamu manages to sneak into Graham's residence. He immediately approaches a painting and takes it off the wall, exposing a secret safe. With the duplicate key he obtained from Cho, he opens the safe. Inside it is an untidy collection of documents which include Graham's personal journal. But other than that, there's nothing that leads to Graham's knowledge of the grand strategy. Gamu reads through the journal. At one point, Graham wrote about buying his wife a parasol, which reminds Gamu of that time Graham reminded Jane about using her parasol. Suddenly, Gamu becomes enlightened. It seems as if everything clicks in for him. So the next day, Gamu meets a mysterious person to report everything he's known so far. Gamu has discovered that the handle of Jane's parasol is hollow. Graham has been inserting messages inside it even without Jane's knowledge, making it possible to communicate without gaining suspicion. As for Shirahata, he's planning to give Graham the information about the grand strategy within the next week, so Graham can leave the country as soon as possible. Also, the previous night, Gamu met Cho in secret to split the money. But then, in an unexpected turn of events, Gamu stabbed Cho as he was counting the money. This was done just so that he could get rid of evidence and make it appear as if Cho tried to rob him. After Gamu concludes his report, the mysterious man says, Kill without hesitation. Die with honor. He then announces Gamu as a new member of Wind Agency. It turns out that this man is Lieutenant Colonel Kazato Akimasa. Six months ago, he discussed the existence of D-Agency with Atsuki. Kazato thought that D-Agency's principle of don't die and don't kill was ridiculous. 
He was also against the idea of using civilians as spies instead of the War College graduates. Therefore, he established a competitor called Wind Agency with the exact opposite motto of D Agencies. Afterward, Kazato relays the information from Gamu to Atsuki. He secured the location of the exchange between Shirahata and Graham, which is in Shirahata's villa in Izu. Now that their preparations are complete, the Wind Agency is planning to move as soon as possible. If they accomplish the mission successfully, Wind Agency will officially be recognized as the IJA's official espionage agency, possibly replacing D Agency. Atsuki himself is informed that D Agency has also received the tip about Shirahata and Graham's situation, so he tells Kazato to keep that in mind. At night, Kazato visits the traditional inn where he and his spies have a meeting. At first, he enters the wrong private room. Upon opening the door, what he sees is an old man flirting with the geisha instead of his subordinates. He immediately goes to the right room after being directed by the geisha. Inside, the spies discuss the recent information they have. It seems that Shirahata is currently at his villa, while Graham has just left. Things are going just as expected. Suddenly, a geisha interrupts them. The door of that room then opens to reveal Jitsui. He's currently acting as Morishima Kunio, someone who lives in Shirahata's villa and works as a houseboy there. The other day, Kazato called Morishima out after finding out that Morishima's adoptive parents falsified his medical records to dodge military drafting. Of course, this is just Jitsui's fabricated background as Morishima, but Jitsui played his role so well that he went as far as to beg on his knees in front of Kazato, asking not to report him. Kazato then decided to use Jitsui or Morishima to spy on Shirahata. So now, Kazato inquires Jitsui if there's anything strange happening at the villa. Jitsui responds that there's nothing particularly unusual apart from the fact that Shirahata ordered the servants to keep the dog in the cage and not cook him breakfast tomorrow. After that, Kazato praises him and promises to let him off the hook. He proceeds to pour Jitsui a cup of sake. Not only that, but he also insists on giving him a free ride home. One of the spies volunteers to drive Jitsui. Once Jitsui leaves, Kazato unrolls his sleeve, uncovering what seems to be a poison dripping device. He then orders his subordinates to prepare themselves for the information exchange between Shirahata and Graham that will occur at 3am. The outcome of this mission will determine Wind Agency's position in the military. In the meantime, Jitsui starts to feel sick. A geisha approaches him to offer help, but the spy beside him refuses it. Ultimately, the spy takes the half-asleep Jitsui to his car and starts driving. Sometime later, they arrive at the edge of the cliff. Below them are nothing but the crashing waves of the sea. Jitsui himself is already sleeping soundly. Shortly after that, the rest of the Wind Agency members turn up at Shirahata's villa. They wait anxiously until 3am, prepared to detain or kill whoever arrives there, but the villa is oddly quiet. And even after it's past the arranged time of the exchange, nobody has yet to be there. Kazato runs around the villa nervously, thinking about what went wrong. That's when he suddenly hears a voice saying, You're late. In front of him, sitting on the chair in Shirahata's study, is none other than Lieutenant Colonel Yuki in person. Kazato angrily accuses Yuki of letting the grand strategy fall into Graham's hands. But in Yuki's defense, that so-called grand strategy contains nonsense. Although Kazato claims that it's Japan's greatest secret, Yuki thinks that it's nothing but mere theories and strategic principles. If the army treats it as some kind of legendary treatise, it just shows how limited they are. Yuki's bold remarks naturally make Kazato furious. He reminds Yuki of the biggest difference between D Agency and Wind Agency. One avoids killing at all costs, while one believes in killing when necessary. Kazato proceeds to announce that he'll retrieve the grand strategy, even if it means killing Shirahata. However, all of a sudden, someone comes from behind him someone who can make Kazato tremble out of shock. Now let's see what happened to Jitsui. The spy from Wind Agency was dragging his body out of the car when Jitsui suddenly made an attack. It all happened so fast that the spy didn't even have the time to defend himself. He quickly realized that Jitsui was with D Agency. Jitsui also confirmed it, admitting that his background was fabricated in order to entrap Wind Agency. And now Jitsui stands before Kazato's eyes. He shows Kazato the tool that allowed him to secretly avoid drinking the poisoned Kazato, and it looks similar to Kazato's poisoning tool. He then turns to Yuki, informing him that Kaminaga and Hatano have dealt with everyone around the villa, while Graham left to catch a boat to Shanghai as soon as he learned about the military's movements from Shirahata. It turns out that D Agency has had their eyes on Shirahata since way before Wind Agency started taking action. D Agency couldn't let anyone harm Shirahata because he's one of the very few channels to England they have left. All this information makes Kazato's blood boil. He pulls out his gun, intending to shoot Yuki. Luckily, Jitsui acts even quicker. 
He shoots Kazato's gun before Kazato can pull the trigger. As Yuki walks away, Kazato threatens to get Yuki court-martialed for leaking Wind Agency's plan to Shirahata. However, Yuki says that he didn't do it. He proceeds to remind Kazato of that one time they both met in the inn. As it turns out, the old man whose room Kazato accidentally entered was Yuki in disguise. When Yuki saw Jitsui leaving in a drunken state from his balcony, he told the geisha to call Shirahata's villa to let them know of Jitsui's condition. Upon receiving that information, Shirahata immediately figured out the situation, so he packed up his stuff and fled. In other words, even if Kazato tries to turn Yuki in, he wouldn't have evidence against Yuki. Yuki and Jitsui then walk away, leaving the utterly dejected Kazato behind. Later, a gunshot is heard from the villa, implying that Kazato has committed suicide. The next story comes from a British spy named Aaron Price. For some reason, he's attempting to gain information regarding Yuki's identity. According to Machiyama, one of his accomplices, there's no record of anyone by Yuki's name in the military database. The details about D agency are also kept secret, even to people working for the Ministry of War. Price then requests Machiyama to send him the military prep school's registry starting from the year 1900. Once Price receives the document, he immediately looks into it in his study. Strangely, Yuki's name isn't on the registry as well, although by logic, such a great spymaster must be a high-ranking commissioned officer. While still focused on his document, Price's wife Ellen suddenly interrupts. She gives him watermelon to cool off during that hot summer. Price thanks Ellen, tells her to go to bed and kisses her on the forehead. It's clear that he's head over heels for her, but he needs to get back to work. He looks at the list of enrollees again and finds something intriguing. There was one registered student named Arisaki Akira who attended the prep school but got expelled for delinquency. Interestingly, the kanji for Arisaki can also be read as Yuki. The next day, Price visits an old man named Satamura, who seems to be a former servant for the Arisaki family. Price introduces himself as a reporter and claims that the friends of Viscount Arisaki, which is Akira's father, are missing him dearly in England, but he makes sure not to mention Akira. Instead, he asks whether the rumor about Viscount Arisaki having an illegitimate child is true. To answer that, Satamura confirms that it's true, and the illegitimate child in question is none other than Arisaki Akira. Satomura then begins telling Akira's story. Back in the winter of 1896, Viscount Arisaki came home to his manor with a mysterious, impoverished-looking child. His name was Akira. The fact that the Viscount was young, charismatic and popular with women was enough to raise a rumor that he'd fathered a geisha's child or something. Some also assumed that Akira was the Viscount's comrade's child or even a princess's illegitimate child. Regardless of that, Akira fit in with the noble life really well. The Viscount was so serious about Akira's education. Not only that, the Viscount himself stepped in to teach Akira martial arts. Yet he never registered Akira as part of the Arisaki family. When Akira was 13, he applied to the military preparatory school as instructed by the Viscount. Satomura thought Akira would end up becoming a decorated soldier due to his impressive grades. But then, an incident occurred. Akira fought with his classmates using a tactic that was deemed cowardice by the principal, and the tactic in question was blinding his opponent with dirt. This caused him to be expelled. Satomura asked Akira why he didn't use his knife to fight back, to which Akira responded that he didn't want to kill anyone. After being expelled, Akira moved to England and studied there. He only came back to Japan once in 1912 to attend Viscount Arisaki's funeral. He then sold off the manor as per the Viscount's wish and distributed most of the money to the servants. Lastly, before Akira left again, Satomura asked whether he could do anything for him. But Akira told him not to worry and whispered, Everyone around me is calling me Duke. Hearing that, Price quickly realizes that the word Duke starts with D. Satomura then shows a picture of Akira with his classmates in England. In the photo, Akira is accompanied by his guardian. Later, back in his home, Price puts together everything he's learned about Akira and Yuki to make a conclusion. Interestingly, Akira's guardian turned out to be Captain Mansfield Cumming of the Royal Navy, and also one of the founders of SIS. Price believes there's a strong possibility that Akira was enrolled in the SIS upon its establishment in 1909. The only thing left is to confirm if this hypothesis is true. However, while Price is still engrossed in his investigation, he hears his wife screaming all of a sudden. Shortly after, three soldiers come to his room, catching him red-handed as he's committing espionage. Price is subsequently brought to the military office to be interrogated. He spends hours there refusing to talk and only gives up because one of the soldiers threatens to make his wife talk instead. But unexpectedly, right before Price is about to speak, Another soldier comes in to order the release of Price. Despite being safe for the moment, for Price, this is really strange. The MP quite literally caught him in the middle of his work, 
so there couldn't be any amount of excuse that would let him go. He thinks that it might have something to do with Satomura, so he decides to visit Satomura again. Upon meeting Satomura the second time, Price cuts to the chase and asks, where's Arisaki Akira? Satomura fulfills his request and brings him to a room. Inside, he shows Price the real Arisaki Akira. Price can't believe his eyes. In front of him is a sleeping, ill and frail man. He looks nothing like the legendary spy master Yuki who's running D-Agency. More shockingly, Satomura says that Akira has been comatose for over 20 years. It started when he was badly hurt during the World War. Satomura asked for medical assistance from the Imperial Army, but since Akira's status was just a volunteer soldier, the army refused. Just as Satomura was about to lose hope of saving Akira, a mysterious man appeared. This man claimed to be a close friend of Akira's from Europe. Like an angel sent from heaven, he offered to pay for Akira's care, but with two conditions. First, Satomura wasn't allowed to ask his name. Second, if anyone were to inquire about Akira's past, Satomura must provide the fabricated version. Satomura has memorized this new version of Akira's past word for word, to the point where he's no longer certain which parts actually happened to Akira. Thanks to Satomura's explanation, Price finally connects the dots. That mysterious man is clearly Yuki, and he went as far as to fabricate his own past to lure out enemy spies. He's also just realized something else. His ring, which contained a micro list of his informants and accomplices for 10 years in Japan, is missing. It's very likely that the military took it. This makes Price sure that those soldiers were actually Yuki's subordinates. Later on, Price finds himself pondering deeply about his life. His most important possession is gone along with his 10 years of accomplishment. All that's left that he can think about is his wife, Ellen. Coincidentally, Ellen calls him. Ellen proceeds to smile and extends her hand, asking Price to go home. Meanwhile, in Germany, a train crash just occurred. Even though unlikely, Colonel Wolf believes that it could be an act of terrorism, so he picks one of the onlookers to be interrogated. With his subordinate Lieutenant Bauer, he asks the suspect why he keeps a matchbox inside his wallet despite him being a non-smoker. On top of that, the wallet he's carrying looks too good to be his. Nervously, the suspect responds that he picked up the wallet from a dead Asian man. The suspect himself can't remember that Asian man's name since he threw away his ID card, but he believes it started with M. As he tries to remember, Wolf whispers, Mackie. The suspect immediately confirms it, making Wolf smirk in victory. Bauer also finds the name Maki Katsuhiko on the list of passengers. Wolf then tells Bauer to investigate Maki's house. Later on, Bauer can be found visiting Maki's house as per Wolf's order. According to his subordinate's report, so far, nothing in the house suggests Maki was a spy. Bauer then approaches Wolf to show him the photos of Maki's dead body as proof of his death. Interestingly enough, the dead man in the photos resembles Miyoshi. It seems like the cause of his death was blood loss and shock after being pierced by the train's steel beam. Bauer himself already showed the pictures to Maki's neighbors, and they all confirmed that it was indeed Maki. But what baffles Bauer is that nobody, not friends or relatives, has come to claim Mackie's body. Other than that, Bauer thinks that there's nothing suspicious about him. However, Wolf has the opposite belief. The aspirin he found on the floor could mean that he was checking if anyone sneaked into his house while he was away. This is a behavior that's often found in spies. Wolf goes to the window. He proceeds to tell Bauer his story from 22 years ago. Back then, the Germans captured a Japanese spy master with the code name The Magician. Wolf was in charge of interrogating him. The spy was tortured for days, yet it wasn't enough to make him speak. Then one day, the spy outwitted Wolf and the other soldiers by sneaking an explosive into the interrogation room. The bomb exploded right in the grip of his left hand, allowing him to escape. Ever since that day, Wolf has never seen that man. Wolf strongly believes that the spy master was Lieutenant Colonel Yuki and Maki was his subordinate. Now that Maki is down, Yuki is definitely going to come for the document that contains the names of Maki's informants and accomplices. That's why Wolf is set on getting him this time. A few days later, Bauer reports to Wolf that he's taken measures to track down Yuki, such as concealing the news of Maki's death, putting Maki's house under surveillance, notifying the Ministry of Aviation, and most importantly, moving Maki's body to Berlin Hospital. Wolf then asks Bauer which way the train was going, and Bauer says toward Berlin. Bauer's answer prompts him to rush to Berlin Hospital. Apparently, the fact that Mackie was going back must mean that he had just been done reporting everything he knew, so the person he was giving the information to must be in the country. Upon arriving at the hospital, Wolf immediately checks Mackie's body. His suspicion is confirmed when he sees Mackie's eyes already closed. Based on the photos, they're supposed to be open. He proceeds to confront the people guarding Mackie's room, asking whether someone came, but they all say no, particularly not since Mackie's body was moved there. Wolf is curious about what that means, so Bauer explains that previously, Mackie was in room 202, 
Bauer himself decided to move him to room 305 yesterday to make it easier to watch him. According to the nurse, Mackie also shared a room with another corpse back in room 202. Moreover, before Bauer arrived yesterday, a man visited that room. Well, it's then revealed that the man was Yuki. He came to see Maki, otherwise known as Miyoshi, and paid his last homage by closing Miyoshi's eyes. He then left while pretending to the nurse that he had the wrong person. After hearing the nurse's testimony, Wolf trembles. He falls to the sofa in complete disbelief as he realizes that he just let Yuki slip out of his hand. Sometime later, Wolf goes to see Miyoshi's funeral from afar. At this point, he has learned what went between Miyoshi and Yuki. It seems like Yuki rushed to Berlin as soon as he got the news about the train crash. Maki himself always carried with him the microfilm containing the list of his accomplices, and it was sewn into his inner collar. After Yuki retrieved the document in the hospital, he made sure to contact everyone on the list to erase the traces of evidence. Now, the last story comes from Odagiri. This one takes place in Japan during the spring of 1939. Odagiri had been keeping an eye on a German man named Karl Schneider, who was suspected to be a double agent for Germany and the Soviet Union. But too bad, Schneider died. This means bad news for Odagiri for a spy can't let their target die. As a result, all eight members of D-Agency, including Miyoshi, who's still alive, are gathered to discuss the situation. On the day of his death, Schneider bought some flowers before going to Nagami Yuriko's apartment. Yuriko herself was Schneider's girlfriend. Since Yuriko was out on that day, he supposedly waited for her inside by himself. Yuriko was back at 3 p.m. with her colleague Yasuhara Miyoko. Then immediately after entering her apartment, she screamed as she found out that Schneider was dead. The death was later ruled a suicide, and the cause was asphyxiation from cyanide poisoning. Most of the spies in the room believe there's nothing suspicious about his death other than his suicide note that contained double X's, which could mean double cross. Then again, it could be the result of him testing out his ink. However, Odagiri thinks that there could be something going on beneath the surface. They also still have to take care of Schneider's spy network regardless. Therefore, Yuki orders each of them a different task to perfectly make sure they're not missing something. Odagiri himself is ordered to investigate Yasuhara Miyoko. At night, Odagiri goes to see Yuriko and Miyoko's performance. Apparently, Miyoko acts as the main character, while Yuriko plays the role of a woman who has to let go of her crush because he loves the main character more. After the performance, the staff happily celebrates Miyoko's performance and gives her a lot of compliments. Meanwhile, Yuriko chooses to seclude herself and goes home immediately, looking depressed. Odagiri watches Yuriko from afar as she leaves. Suddenly, he's reminded of a memory, a memory of him spending his childhood with the woman who took care of him. While he's still standing speechless, an employee comes in, bringing some bouquets of flowers for Miyoko. Apparently, Miyoko is the most popular and arguably the most talented actress they have. At least a dozen bouquets are being sent to her. However, according to the employee, Miyoko's flowers have recently been sent back to a nearby florist to prevent them from going to waste. On Odagiri's way back from the theater, his fellow spy mates report their findings one by one. Each of them implies that there's nothing suspicious about Schneider's death. Odagiri is puzzled. He doesn't understand why they're reporting to him. To him, it's as if they're trying to mock him. But then again, he needs to take responsibility for his failure to let his target die. The next time Yuriko and Miyoko perform, Odagiri visits the theater again. This time, Yuriko amazes the audience with her impressive performance. She falls to her knees and weeps when it's time for her character to let go of her lover. But little does everyone know that her tears are shed from deep within her heart. Her genuine yearning for Schneider allows her to express her emotions to the fullest. After the show, Miyoshi approaches Odagiri to give him some reports. As Odagiri has already known, the flowers in the theater have been delivered back to a nearby florist. There's a man assigned to deliver them, and Miyoshi decided to tail him. Apparently, after collecting the flowers, the man rode his vehicle and stopped at a seemingly ordinary florist. However, it's actually a secret post for Soviet spies. It turns out that the man is a spy who communicates using flower codes. Schneider himself made contact with two Soviet spies before he died. One was that florist man and one was Miyoko. Needless to say, Odagiri already knew about the latter part because the scent of the flowers in Yuriko's apartment just after the incident was the same as the flowers delivered to Miyoko. According to Odagiri's hypothesis, there's a probability that Schneider planned to give away his intel to the British so the Soviets took action, killing him while making it look like a suicide. Also, right after Miyoko and Yuriko witnessed Schneider's dead body, Yuriko immediately rushed off to notify the police. 
But strangely, Miyoko stayed inside. She could have used her time there to set the suicide note on the table and write the double cross. Even though the note was proven to be written by Schneider himself, there's still a chance Miyoko deliberately prompted him to write it down such as by telling him that it's the code for their meeting. A few days later, Odegeri meets with Yuki in private. Yuki says that Miyoko has confessed to Schneider's murder and the police thanked D agency for that. Then out of nowhere, Yuki asks Odegeri, did Nogami Yuriko resemble Nishiyama Chizuru? Odegiri is taken aback by this question. He confesses that it's true. When he first laid his eyes on Yuriko, the images of Chizuru came back to him. Chizuru herself was the woman who raised Odegiri when he was little. She was the daughter of Chizuru's neighbor. Odagiri treated her as his own older sister as he had no one but his grandparents who were too old to take care of him. However, a terrible fate befell Chizuru. She eloped with an irresponsible man who ended up abandoning her. In the end, she died of tuberculosis before she ever made it back to her hometown. Odagiri said in his report that he didn't notice when Schneider died. By that alone, Yuki could tell that Odagiri was distracted by the spectre of Chizuru. Yuki proceeds to ask Odagiri if he won't reconsider his resignation, and Odagiri nods. His memories of Chizuru are his reason for living. He just can't bring himself to abandon them for the sake of missions. Yuki then gives Odagiri his dismissal. He announces that Odagiri will be assigned to Manchuria as a lieutenant. Lastly, before Odagiri leaves Yuki's office, Yuki calls him by his real name. Tobisaki Hiroyuki. Yuki's final message to him is, don't die. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.